So we have just started, everyone, and welcome to uh, you know the session. The session title is about guarding against the next crisis. Well, it sounds very good, and uh, the present crisis, of course, uh, they were talking about and uh, coronavirus, I think, and uh, uh, greater frequency of uh, pandemics and other uh, catastrophic risks have created a deep challenge. And are there better focusing modes or scenario analysis that will deliver proactive responses to future catastrophic stocks? And how can India's public and private sector guard against the next crisis? And how can India cooperate with its foreign partners? Of course, we have got some uh, people from uh, from and other side of India, so you don't have to stick to India necessarily. And I'm going to link what you talk about to, to something related to India. Okay. We have got the three and the very prominent speakers. And uh, first speakers, I'd like you, you know, Natalia, to say something. And also, please introduce yourself. And following that, please uh, talk about what you think about this, this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening. Morning. On behalf of Bright Adventures, um, I'm really honored to be included to this session and look for the solutions, uh, how to anticipate, prevent, and uh, mitigate the risks uh, of the crises. And um, let me introduce Bright Adventures first. Uh, Bright Adventures is a global non-profit organization on a mission to change the stereotypes of entrepreneurship by advancing high growth potential women-led startups all over the world. Um, at Bright Adventures, we identify high growth potential women-led startups, connect them with the resources they need to succeed, such as coaching, networking, access to capital, and um, advisory how to grow, how to scale their companies, what should be the changes in the policies, what should be the public and private support in different countries to let women entrepreneurs thrive. And I think that women will play an essential role in preventing and uh, mitigating the risks of crises because when you involve women, when you invest in women, uh, you also invest to the community because naturally uh, women do care about the communities and uh, women led, women started enterprises, uh, both small, medium businesses and high growth potential startups. Uh, they do create social good and uh, uh, are very much oriented on achieving the uh, sustainable development goals and acting within the framework of ESG principles and uh, really motivated to find the solutions not only for themselves, not only for the value creation of their companies, but also for the local communities and the broader society. So we, what, what, what we observe during current crisis, uh, we see that it has disproportionately affected women both in terms uh, of the lost jobs and in terms of the access to the care for the children and also the disproportionate involvement of women to um, senior care, to the, uh, to the senior care work and uh, the nursing work and so on. So many, many women are not involved at the moment to uh, the recovery from the crisis and to the uh, work, uh, prevention work right now. So I think that uh, the role of both public and uh, private institutions uh, in India is to ensure that uh, there are thoughtful and structured and uh, um, continuous actions taken to ensure that women have the resources to get back to the workforce and they have the resources to get involved to uh, the solutions creation, solutions finding uh, work together with uh, institutions and uh, together with corporations in India. So 
what's what's important it is important to ensure that uh the financial support comes uh to the women led small medium businesses women led high potential startups uh which can participate in uh problem in problem solving and in finding the solutions it's important to ensure that uh the policies and uh, the systems of uh child care provision are re- uh, are revised and uh, that women have uh more time to get involved to the economic activity and to the problem solving activity and the same is the same as with senior care and if there, there are no concrete actions in uh, that direction then in case of the next crisis we will be in the same situation women won't be able to be involved as an economic power to mitigate the crisis to prevent the crisis uh i think that women led startups uh specifically in the sectors uh of uh, med tech uh and healthcare if at, if we're talking about uh the crisis like current uh covid-19 crisis uh can uh help to do two things the first one is uh to continue further development of solutions based on the cutting edge technologies uh ensuring that there are smart clinics that there is a remote healthcare that there is a telemedicine in um, each uh, region of india and that it is accessible to different groups uh, of the population and then secondly i think it is important to involve uh, women led uh, startups especially the ones uh, oriented on social impact uh, to help scaling up the solutions available internationally because then they can bring the solutions which uh already have been tested and working in other countries but are not available yet uh in india it's it's important to get local communities involved because ad- adoption is important and uh, the wide use is only achievable if there are local champions and uh, again women uh, can play that important role in the communities so that's that's my intro and uh, happy happy to discuss uh, yes, thank you very much yes. and uh, before that can i ask you uh, a few things about uh, what you talked about right now natalia one thing is that you know the impact of the uh, covid-19 is uh, you know is bigger on on female uh, you know workers and, uh, and people and uh, also the the effect that prolonged and uh, rather than men and uh, could you could you tell me a little bit about it uh yes so it's almost impossible in many countries to get women back uh to workforce after the uh jobs was lost because of the crisis and uh it it happens because it's not only about women just finding other jobs but it's also because women still need to um solve their children care problems and uh, there are senior people who uh require their support from women after after covid and uh in the countries uh, which cannot provide uh the senior care and child care support at the level it was provided before covid for different reasons for the reasons of uh, availability of the facilities uh or for the economic reasons because not uh, uh, uh money cannot be allocated at the same level it means that women uh, will have to stay at home and uh, on the one hand yes uh there there is a leap in uh, the remote work uh fac- facilities and uh, uh remote r- remote work tools but as we know if we want to solve big problems then uh team work is required work in the labs is required so uh women need to get back to the workplaces as well 
and uh, in India, uh, given their geography, given mm. uh, their uh, given their locations uh, of the research centers uh, of the uh, main institutions spread around the country, given uh, the need to exchange experience, the need to meet people and advocate uh, mm -hmm. their solutions to prevent the next crises. It's important for women entrepreneurs, small medium businesses, startups mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. get out of daily routines at home. Thank you so much and the in-depth analysis on the women and also SMEs uh, in a perspective, I think. Okay, Lajib, and uh, thank you for joining from India and, uh, and uh, today's uh, team country. And uh, please, uh, you know, make a you know, presentation about uh, the topic. And uh, uh, of course, uh, first, I'd like you to, you know, uh, make uh, yourself the introduction. Uh, thank you, Kenji. And... Uh Good morning to all from India. This is uh, mm -hmm. about eight eight thirty in the in, in this country. Um, so this this platform, uh, you know, this is uh, the, 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 the the various things that that I do, and just just wanted to briefly introduce uh, myself. Um, so I, I would start by saying this pandemic has given me an opportunity to start something afresh, which is. Uh, which is very new to this country and a kind of a, a development in terms of a business idea uh, during the lockdowns, etc., which is doorstep delivery of fuel. So that's that's a startup uh, that that we that we do. It's delivering of uh, diesel at the doorstep for businesses. That's that's what I do. Uh, past uh, thirty years, I've been into the security and safety. Uh, industry, um, managing men guarding and security technology companies, having collaborations across the across the globe, and uh, you know uh, uh, the last but not the least, I also represent uh, OSPAs in India, the Outstanding Security Performance Awards, based out of UK. But that that's also I represent in Asia. Uh, so that's that's about my my introduction. And now since the topic of the country is India and I'm born and brought up and I've been through uh, last one and a half, uh, two years in India. See, the, the strength and the, the problem in India, both are same, which is population. You know, having a large population could be a strength when we say that, okay, 65% of our population is young, but then it is the population is too large. So what what we have seen is is you know two extreme waves of uh, of COVID. If we speak uh, uh, you know as of now, there are thirty one point three three million total cases that we have had in the in the, in the past eighteen months. Uh, even today, there are four hundred three. Thousand cases which are still active, with an average of about thirty-five to forty-five thousand new cases. Now, from north to south and from east to west, you know, it's it's like a every state is is, is like a different country, different culture, different climate, different environment, different eating habit, different languages, etc., etc. So it's very different. So so in last uh, three weeks four weeks in the northern part of uh, India, the, the numbers are coming down, but it, they're, they're, as it is in the eastern part, they're kind of increasing, decreasing in the southern part. So it, it is it is varying. However, April, May, June was a very severe, um, uh, severe wave, uh, second wave in India. And we had many, many, many casualties. And a lot of, you know, first wave was numbers. The second wave was names. So, you know, that was uh, very, very scary in terms of people living here. I'm sure every country across the globe faced a uh, difficult situation, but it was it was too bad here. Why? Uh, uh, you know, some sometimes there are, the people do mistakes. One, because uh, uh, no one was aware that, you know, what is this, how, how to control this pandemic? You know, we had an example of 100 years ago, when we had that plague situation, 
no one was prepared i mean if you say we were prepared for a pandemic there is no past experience in the living history that you know people should prepare for pandemic so nobody was prepared um unfortunately in india the public health is not a very serious subject you know the public health is is not a very serious subject we take things for granted and and that has happened and you know that that got us really unaware so if we have to talk about that how do we guard ourselves for the next such kind of a crisis i think the the first or the foremost now should be be prepared you know we need to be all be prepared how do we how do we prepare ourselves likewise we prepare for a you know for a for a for a fire situation likewise we prepare for an earthquake or any natural calamity you know I, earlier we didn't know what to do about such uh, situations such, such accidents but you know now we we, we do a you know offices buildings residential communities you know every infrastructure everyone does a fire drill everyone does a you know natural calamity so we need to devise some kind of a situation that in case certain similar thing happens once again how are we prepared what to do this time we nobody knew what to do they had nobody had an experience across the world what to do. so i think preparedness to and and practice perhaps is the first thing first thing that we should do uh yes uh, india is now taking public health seriously uh, like i'm sure like all, all, all other countries as i said it, it being a large population the healthcare and infrastructure facilities kind of uh, were overwhelmed especially in the in the second wave uh, of covid here which is in which was in april uh, april and may and the infrastructure facilities completely completely collapsed now while this was happening in one part of the country as i said with a large population and you know so many activities happening we were we were having elections we were having religious large gatherings etc etc so one part was you know was undergoing the crisis the under the, the second part of the country the other part of the countries are busy were busy in different uh, activities so public awareness and a unity between all private and public sector is important now what happened uh, as a general feeling and it is purely my personal statement that since the government was busy in doing uh, you know managing other things the, the private sector came up the private sector came up to help its own employees the families of the employees uh, whether it is uh, uh, hospitalization whether it is uh, arrangement for oxygen so we, we had a scarcity of oxygen uh, in in many many cities in india uh, which was you know which was very very horrifying but that, that's the fact uh, you know the, the, we had shortage of oxygen cylinders so so corporates came up they came up to manage their employees their families uh even now in vaccination sudden we have seen a sudden jump of course the government is pushing it too high as we speak we i think about 25 to 26% of the population has got one jab and about 6.8 6.9% of the population has now got two jab so corporate has done a a, a major role now but but going forward it is important that the public and the private sector you know they have to work hand in hand and which i think this is this is evolving as i said this is a great learning experience for uh, for everybody uh, whether it is in the public sector whether in the corporate like we discussed that we are on a platform was never you know it was it could have been never possible otherwise so we are learning we are learning things so this is this is important that public and the private sector work together we need to we need to we have learned and we should we should it should be a part of our preparedness that how quickly we react to the situation we can't wait and wait and wait and wait to react unfortunately and i'm i'm picking up uh, most of the examples from uh, from india because that's that's what we saw and we reacted very late again in case of the second wave we reacted really really late i'm sure the decision makers all the stakeholders had their own um, uh, reasons to react the way they did but as a general feeling as a general feeling and as as, as my personal opinion we reacted very late so e- even if it is a a a a border uh, management situation if we have to 
seal the borders, if we have to stop uh, communic transportation from here and there. We need to do now. We need to do quickly. We need to do very, very... I mean, we, we, we cannot afford to wait uh, till the time the situation goes out of hand. Of course, management of economy in the country like India is also a very big challenge. And I'm sure that was the challenge that the, all the stakeholders and the government and, and the decision makers were thinking about. You know, if we, if we close down everything, then economy goes to a loss. Uh, in case we get into this situation, we need to track, trace and isolate. Even then, there have to be... So what, what also happened here... I, and I'm, I, I'm sure this happened um, in many places uh, in the world. That the, the the situation was so uncertain that we didn't know what to do. So the policies were changing. And in India, and, and in India, as I as I as I'm saying since the beginning, there was some policy in the north. There was some policy in the west. There was some policy uh, in the east. So the policies have to be unified and you know work. Work in tandem. We, we missed it and we have to be very, very careful about it uh, going forward. Uh, I, I, not, not in the first wave, but definitely in the second wave in India. Um, uh, or in, in fact, uh, I would say perhaps in, the both, in, in both the times that how do we prevent such kind of a disease, such kind of a pandemic, from spreading within the healthcare facilities, we were not prepared for that as well. We were not prepared for that as well, and that has caused somehow a, a marginal, uh, you know, uh, numbers going northwards because people, the doctors, the the healthcare staff, even the even the people were not were not uh, didn't know what to do. One, the the infrastructure was overwhelmed, and otherwise. Because it was very dynamic, because the situation you know was changing every day, we people were not aware. I would, I would very quickly give you an example. I had to take my wife for a; uh, she was feeling unwell, and I thought I have. We need to go for a for a for a ECG, and we went to the place uh, where I go, where I stay. We went to about seven different large, you know, mid-sized large healthcare facilities. Five of them did not have an entry. It was so overwhelmed, you know. It was so so overwhelmed that we could not get in. So one of the one of these things where I where I knew people and that gentleman came and with the blood pressure measuring machine and he did and he said you have to go for an ECG but not here. This took us about seven five to seven minutes and I saw three people dying then and there on the road. So what, how do we manage the healthcare facilities is perhaps uh, one of the biggest challenge that we face and this is to be, this is to be addressed uh, going forward in, in case we face some similar kind of a situation. Also, I think last, last but not the least, last but not the least, I would take one more minute, Kenji, that, uh, that, that, that building and uh, building and, and maintain, maintenance of public confidence is very important. Uh, in India, especially as I said earlier, 65% population is the younger population. So I do not know whether we should do uh, vaccination for the younger population so that they can take care of the larger population or we should do for the elderly, of course, because the first wave was affecting them. But the younger generation in any country has to be has has to prepare for this to manage things, has to has to gear up. Uh, you know, they, they should be in the front line to manage things. And I think uh, in, in the recent uh, few weeks, they have, that is what they have done. They have been doing it all through 18, 19 months in across the countries. But they should be given the responsibility to take care of these situations uh, going forward. So so, so with this, uh, I think this is what I, I want to say in the opening comments. Uh, thank you so much, Kenji. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you so much. You mentioned a very, you know, uh, Good points. I've never, you know, uh, understood so far. But India is uh, different countries. Within India, there are four main part differences. But that's one thing. Also, you have with a large number of uh, young people, sixty-five percent. It's amazing, actually. And another one is that you still have, uh, you know, a big, very big problem with, uh, you know, public health matters. I think. And uh, okay. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about uh, them in detail later.
and uh, Scott. And uh, you're last but not least, actually. And uh, please introduce yourself. After that, please make a, a speech about this topic. Well, thank you, and good morning, and good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, as it would be for everybody out there. Uh, my name is Scott Mordell. I'm the CEO of a advisory group, the CEO advisory group called the Forder Group. But uh, also, most recently, I've been a CEO of YPO, a Global Association of CEOs, founded in 1950. There's 31,000 CEOs in 140 countries, including India and um, just so many different places. And through COVID, we've had an incredible opportunity to um, see and experience the crisis through the eyes of all of our member leaders. And also, as we begin to look forward and work our way forward, um, we're, we're, we're seeing some of the trends of what's what's working, what's not working, and, and where people are. So I consider myself a student of leadership. And when we talk about what organizations should do or what government should do, um, it's really important to think about what are the leaders of those organizations and companies doing about that, because it's a, it's, it really flows from the leaders. And with that, I love this topic very much, uh, because we're talking about guarding um, against the next crisis. We're all very much in the current crisis still, uh, as we would call it, COVID, in different ways in the different countries around the world. And um, yet it's, a, it's quite a, um, quite amazing that uh, we're all having a common experience here um, in, in many ways that's unifying of, of, our, of our world um, in some ways. Every country has a COVID experience, which we couldn't always say that, say that as time had gone in the past. I very much agree with Rajiv relative to preparation that uh, um, in a crisis, um, preparation, while the whatever you prepared for is really working the exact same way, the fact that you did prepare makes you much, much better uh, positioned to make better decisions um, and, and really work your way through things. So anything you can do in your crisis plans um, and, and the rest and, and really go through some practice and some scenario work to uh, to be prepared for, for a crisis is, is, is quite important. With that, though, I would suggest that one of the most important things we can do to guard against the next crisis is to debrief internally relative to what we've done in this crisis. Uh, what have we learned? What have we learned about ourselves? Who, who, who performed? Who was a star? Where did we struggle? What was unexpected? What could we have done better? Um, uh, um, there's so much learning we can do in the way that we work together within our organizations to really do a debrief. And it's so easy to continue to work forward and, and work on the moment of the day. But looking back, spending some time in a retroactive and, and really uh, adjusting to that in a very intentional way is quite important, I think, to prepare for us to prepare organizations for our, our next crisis as, as we go. So, so the debrief is, is really big time step number one. And then also uh, there's really what is our situation planning as, as, we, as we do our strategy work now, okay? And, and so um, not just what's happening around us, but what's happening around us, what, what, what does that imply for us as, as we go forward? Early on in the, um, in the COVID uh, pandemic, I think it was last March, in YPO, we were fortunate to have a, a professor from the University of Chicago, uh, Greg Bunch, um, who um, you may have heard of the VUCA theory, the, 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 the um, volatility, uh, uncertainty, complexity, um, and ambiguity kind of mindset. But more important than the mindset, he shared four questions, which we cycled our way through uh, at YPO. And I'm finding extraordinarily insightful just as I continue my own uh, agile thinking about a strategy. The first question is what makes us great? What makes us great today in a, in a pandemic could be different than what made us great a year ago. And quite frankly, as we look forward, what's gonna make us great in the future could be quite a bit different. So continuing to assess what makes us great and and using data to prove it uh, one way or the other. Second is, what's our competition doing? What, what, what are they doing? What, why are they doing that? What, what, what's happening with that? How have they responded to the crisis? What, what, what new business models? Uh, where are they moving their business? What's, what's really happening with that? And I find that very insightful to do that constantly. Third is, what data is fascinating? There are so many incredible data points that are just popping up and maybe they're not coming out of a business silo. Maybe they're just coming up. But 
um, sitting in a room with really smart people and asking what data is really fascinating to them actually creates new levels of thinking and maybe new levels of awareness of what could be impending in, in different ways. And finally, if the fourth question is all it is, is um, what patterns are powerful? What, what are you seeing that's happening over and over again uh, that, that, that um, uh, really is becoming a pattern or you could see a pattern? And ultimately, uh, what, what does that mean? And if you make time to go through those things, and we did that within YPO, we're continuing to do that. Uh, and I know they're continuing to do that as I've, if I'm not the CEO of YPO currently now. Um, I, I know that they're continuing to work their way through the, that, that level of thinking. And it creates incredible insights. And that's really the opportunity. Yes, uh, um, we want to guard against the next crisis, but uh, I think uh, inherent in that question is we want to take advantage of the next crisis too, and and, and not not forgetting the fact that there's opportunity uh, within all that is, is quite important. With that kind of process in place, then I'm just going to go back to Peter Drucker and every other management guru back in the day. Um, what about your people? Okay, um, uh, plans don't solve themselves and strategies are great, but it ends up being about people. And what is your team? How, how is your team? Do you, have, do you have people who are performers? Do you have people who are performers for the future? Really, really look hard at that. And, and we keep hearing about talent management and, and what it takes, but this is um, to prepare for the next crisis and be, be on guard and to take advantage of the next crisis is to be very urgent about your talent management and making sure you've got your team ready. Uh, I mean, you have a ready team, and, 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 and all of that is particularly important as it goes. And with that, building off of that, comes the timeless management skills of uh, truly the competence, and you have trust among your team. Your team can't solve a crisis if there's no trust among them. Um, are, are, are they relying upon each other for their competence and for, for their, for their uh, execution and delivery? Is there transparency? Is, is everybody feeling that they're really truly part of the whole? And are you demonstrating that as, as your leader? And is there value alignment? Is there mission alignment? If your team doesn't have value and mission alignment, then in a crisis, everybody's going to go in different directions and any leader is going to be relying on her authority to make everybody fall in line. And that doesn't last long and that doesn't create optimal outcomes. So it's to prepare for the next crisis is to be urgent about what we all know we need to do, which is to, to, to understand our landscape understand uh, and, and demonstrate that uh, um, we've got a process of how we're assessing the landscape and to continue to make sure that we've got the best people that we can possibly have for, for the future, not necessarily for the past. And that's quite uh, quite really the, the approach. It doesn't matter if it's a government, doesn't matter if it's an agency, doesn't matter if it's a division within a company uh, or organization. It ends up being the same kind of things that we need all of us as leaders to do in order to guard against the next crisis. And let's, uh, let's add the part on that uh, maybe didn't put, which is to take advantage of the next crisis and so that we come out uh, stronger as, as that would go. And finally, I truly, and we talked a little bit before this, this uh, discussion started um, among us as panelists, and, and it's, this is amazing. Uh, if you think about the, the COVID situation, we, we shut down 80% of global GDP uh, for the sake of protecting humanity um, in, in 2020. Mm. Think about that. It doesn't matter the government, doesn't matter the, the, the form of government, doesn't matter the economic position, doesn't matter the size of the uh, or, you know, country. Um, we locked down, that the world locked down. It, it's 80% of global GDP so that we could protect each other. And, and so we're unified as humanity relative to this crisis in, in, in different ways. And, and so I, I think this is time, even though we're doing this electronically, it's a time to celebrate our humanity and appreciate our humanity and appreciate that we can still be here. Technology is enabling us to be here and, and, and to engage this. So there's opportunity within all of this. And uh, I think it, there's a mindset of energy that says um, uh, we can be a, we can be a, worried and, 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 on our, and on our heels, or we can be really standing forward and leaning forward as we go. And, and so I've been blessed to be able to come to India um, a, a number of times. And tactically, I would say that the people in India handle the unexpected better than so many other countries. Yeah. And uh, what we want to do is we want to do that at scale, okay, across our organizations. And, and I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about what we can all do. So uh, thank you, uh, Kenji. I'll, I'll turn it back to you. 
Thank you. And uh, Scott, actually, I'm especially very impressed with uh, you mentioning the name of uh, and uh, Peter Drucker, actually. I thought American business people already forgot the name of Peter Drucker, that kind of uh, genius and uh, historic person, actually. Japanese people very you know, appreciate his thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, he, he, he hasn't really written for the current time, so, and, and so oh, okay. uh, some, some would okay. read, wouldn't like the pronouns and all the rest of it, but uh, what, what he had yeah. to share, I think, is truly timeless. And, Every and time you have got your piece of some difficulty, you need to go back to that kind of uh, classical you know, literature, I think. Yeah. Thank you so much. Also, what you mentioned that uh, you know applied to any any situation, any kind of uh, any kind of you know very human mindset or something, and applied to any any. Okay, thank you, Natalia. You want to say something? And please uh, discuss freely. Yeah. I I wanted to build on what Scott said about uh, comparing yourself to the competition. What made you great? And, uh, yeah. What uh, your competitors have done great. You know, I think that uh, preparing uh, for the crisis, uh, guarding against the next crisis, should it be the ecological crisis uh, or uh, the crisis uh, not caused by, by the global pandemic, uh, supply chain crisis like uh, the ones mm -hmm. previous, we had in the previous months. I think in all those situations, it's important not only to think in terms of competition and your competitive advantages, but also think uh, about impact we can create all together as uh, corporates, as uh, uh, public-private partnerships, as startups or uh, small medium businesses. And it's I I I, I fully uh, agree with Scott. It really resonates with me that we need to go forward doing what we've started to do. Think not only about risk and returns, but also think about impact and uh, see what should be changed in regulations, legislations to accommodate the new norms mm -hmm. that um, we figured out in the last one and a half year are absolutely mm -hmm. necessary. And okay. uh, these new norms should empower markets and use inequality. And in India, it's vitally important because there is there is inequality, right? And uh, it's economic inequality, it's access to medicine, access to education inequality, which can be improved via technologies. And we realize the power of and, and the speed of technology penetration. And uh, let's go forward with that. And I'm sure that it should not only be uh, top down, it should be bottom, especially in India with young population who can be advocates, ambassadors, and uh, they, 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 can, they can do a lot should they uh, be empowered, both financially and uh, through access to education, access to experience and knowledge share. Thank you. Scott, would you, say, would you want to say something about that? In, a, in addition to a competition and uh, kind of cooperation is uh, very important. And uh, also, Rajiv, do you want to say something? Yes, uh, I agree with both uh, Scott and, and, and Natalia. See, so the new way forward is uh, is uh, collaborate uh, and cooperate. That's how uh, the businesses are, are going to work. And that is not only applicable in the same kind of businesses, but also, I mean, if we, if we, if we, if we join hands with competition, we are a larger and a stronger team. And that's the way forward. That's, that's, what, that's what I think. In the recent crisis, as Natalia just mentioned about the supply chain that we saw in a couple of months, it, it, it is only the competition from this side to that side joining hands and, and, and sorting out the problems. And, and that's the way forward. Uh, even here, I was, uh, I, I, you know, we were just discussing um, a, a, a project on purification yesterday from somewhere. So somebody doing uh, in the US internal in, indoor purification, somebody doing in UK outdoor purification, and there is a solution which is required in India. So that's that's the way forward because they can't start up something new. They can't find out a new partner. India doesn't have both the things. So collaboration, collaborate and cooperate. Yes, I think it's it's 
it's perhaps the biggest lesson learned uh, from this pandemic. Largely, okay. and one thing is that you mentioned the importance of collaboration and competition, collaboration, especially collaboration between private sector and public sector in terms of uh, public health and the improvement of the public health. Do, do, would you want to, you know, propose something? And uh, also, you do not uh, in ask only public sector to to improve the, you know. Uh, uh, you know, public health. Actually, you need help from uh, public sectors. That's what you and uh, uh, Natalia mentioned. That you know, it will be a very good opportunity for female entrepreneurs in the, for, for 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 medical field. Actually, and Rajiv, do you want to say something in cooperation between the private sector and public sector? Yes, I, I would like to give uh, give an example here to. Uh, hmm. To rear, rear and from. As I said, that a lot of corporates were, uh, you know, there's a lot of corporates starting, coming up, and helping uh, in terms of the medical and healthcare, and you know, now now vaccination. But another very good uh, initiative that few residential communities took here. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, mm. I'm not aware that is that that does happen in other parts of the world or not. But in in India. For example, the community that, that, that I live in, we have a community hall. So the all temporary community hall, the party places, etc., etc., with the help of government stakeholders was converted into a temporary healthcare facility with availability of oxygen, with availability of a doctor just a, you know, across the road, etc., etc. So this, there are various, various places. There were... There were uh, uh, vaccination drive-in vaccination uh, programs. So you are sitting in the car. You get into a mall. You get into a shopping mall. Get yourself vaccinated and go out. Again, a, a very brilliant example of public-private uh, partnership. So this, so, so the pandemic has made us learn this uh, public-private partnership or, or or competition and collaboration or or uh, you know cooperation and collaboration. So India has learned. India has learned the hard way, but India is learning more. Hmm. And uh, Scott, you know, would you give us uh, some example, some suggestion about, uh, you know, development of kind of telemedication or something? Is there any idea? Or, you know, besides that, do you have anything you suggest for the future business to, to make ourselves prepared for the next uh, crisis? Well, first of all, the role of the CEO and of the leader and really all of us aspiring mm -hmm. to be CEOs and leaders is, is changing. And, and mm -hmm. this idea of collaboration, thank you for highlighting that, Natalia, uh, when you did, because it's more than just the classic, we compete against somebody else. It, it, it's it's where's, where's the collaboration? Where's are people connecting outside of their existing typical spots uh, and, and creating a, a collaboration and, and discussion? Meetings like this are very important for that, uh, but, mm -hmm. but also... Uh, beyond that, um, the role of the CEO is is to connect, is to connect their their business to, to, to other other places and other opportunities. In YPO, we we saw people come together from all around the world. Um, they're just moving, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, personal safety uh, equipment and, and masks and ventilators and everything else. And people were starting up businesses and making them available, and making the. A, available across uh, national lines and, and the, there was a brokerage basically of, of, of all of that activity and you know we didn't command it uh, that the, the governments didn't command it it's like everybody just uh, turned in action and that kind of collaboration that leads to future trust that leads to current trust and that leads to a lot mm -hmm. of impact that happens right now and so it's mm -hmm. been very it's been a very troubling year uh, for sure, but it's also been a very inspiring year uh, to, to see people doing that. And, and so I'm sure everybody um, uh, has, has come into different ways of doing business and doing things outside of their business uh, as a result of the pandemic. And, um, you know, that's just a sign of it. Thank you so much. And uh, also, Natasha, can I ask you one? Natalia, I'm sorry. And uh, also, you, you mentioned the importance of uh, female and entrepreneur, actually. How female entrepreneurs, of how female CEOs, they should play a big role. What kind of role they should play for making themselves prepare for the you know next crisis? Thank Is you. Is there for anything the you expect? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this question. 
uh, I think, uh, first of all, they should advocate the role of women and involve more women intentionally and mm. ensure that uh, they have the role and uh, that they have proper coaching, proper support, proper sponsors inside their organizations, both in corporations and in startups and in venture world uh, and uh, in, uh, uh, pub- in the public sector. Secondly, I think that uh, it's important uh, that uh, women-led startups, uh, science and se- science intense uh, startups, bring continue bringing technology, and uh, women play their role just knowing the needs of the communities better, and they can uh, uh, guarantee a great product market fit and ensure that the right technologies are picked to support. And uh, it's so, you know, it's all about uh, user experience and uh, the uh, ability uh, of the companies, of the new, uh, of the startups to serve, uh, to serve as well the solutions they provide. Speaking, again, speaking about telemedicine, uh, there are solutions implemented in different countries and spe- specifically solutions implemented in big cities which may uh, work well in India, in Indian uh, metropolitan areas, right? Uh, so those solutions allow uh, the faster, better, more precise, more accurate mm. decision-making mm. of the doctors, uh, mm. better, faster analysis of the patient's uh, data, uh, smoother collaboration between hospitals and uh, employers, to get uh, information about the um, employees' vaccination. Examples examples like that. Uh, And uh, that can be scaled from one country to another country. But I think women have a role to play to uh, customize the solution locally, just because they are on the forefront of uh, uh, the care uh, of the problem solving in the healthcare uh, crises uh, like the, the current pandemic. Thank you. As you have noticed that, that this session has formally finished and not streaming anymore, but, uh, I, you know, finally I want to, you know, listen to what kind of thing you want to say as a conclusion. And uh, also, Rajiv, do you want to say something as a conclusion? After that, let me ask Scott. And, uh, uh, you know, what kind of thing you want to say as a conclusion? Rajiv, you want to say something as a conclusion? Yes. Um, see, uh, such kind of things are very uncertain, you know. So, you, if you we, if we have to actually answer the question that how do we guard ourselves against the next pandemic, I don't think uh, there, is a, there, is certain, there is a certain answer. But likewise, we prepare for every crisis or every calamity or every you know uncertain situation. I think practice, practice, and practice. Mm. That's the mm. that's the mm. only thing that we should do. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Scott. Uh, thank you so much. It's, it's been been shared already, and I just want to thank everybody for this. My, my, my takeaway or, or my, my share to this just for, for us is it, it's important to um, it, be intentional about guarding against the next crisis and, and, and to have some kind of process, some kind of attention, step out of the immediacy of what, what feels what feels like you need to do now, but, but really spend some, some time, spend some capital, spend some attention uh, really thinking about this, this, this next crisis or the implications or, or the uh, scenarios that could possibly happen. And the more we spend, the more we prepare, the more we're ready to take advantage of the situation when it does occur. Thank you so much. And Natalia, would you want to say something? Uh, yes, no. my call for action after this session is uh, that India will be better prepared for the crisis, uh, employing technology, engaging uh, people from uh, different industries, uh, engaging women entrepreneurs as uh, the uh, voices of the community to uh, adopt the technology and to ensure uh, that uh, there are clear 
very clear instructions what to do in uh, in the next crisis situation. Thank you so much. And finally, let me say something. And uh, I've got a lot of you know things I want to take back my home actually. Uh, one thing I want to tell you is that uh, you know Scott told you, told that uh, we you know spend a large amount of money for saving a lot of people in this time who you know sacrificed more than eighty percent of the GDP actually. And human beings are you know I think uh, having always good will actually and also com- and compassionate. And uh, no matter what happens, that kind of mindset plays a very important role. And the people, people manage the company. If people, you know, decide uh, what what they have to do next time. So, human beings are very important. I understand that. Thank you so much. Okay, I I hope you know uh, you know. Let's stay in touch. Let's stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Be well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.